What's up, you guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Stella Ray Herself podcast. New episodes every Thursday, so make sure you're subscribed on YouTube. Follow on Apple Podcasts. You can also listen on Spotify and pretty much anywhere podcasts are available. How are y'all doing today? Good to be back. If you guys listened to last week's podcast, it was with Sonia and it was a great episode. So you guys should definitely check that out if you haven't already. I feel like it was such a good mix of lols and serious stuff and just such i mean isn't it always with us and it was just such a good almost representation i feel of how far we've come i really enjoyed the episode so let me know if you guys did so we have some exciting things i wouldn't say they're exciting we have some great topics today so i'm really excited to get into it before we get started beverage check comment below if you're listening on youtube your beverages i have a grande cold brew with one pump cinnamon dolce syrup, one pump of pumpkin sauce, and a splash of oat milk. I just have to tell y'all, because if you remember, and maybe you experienced it, maybe you live in California, because it, it was pretty much all of California a few weeks ago. Worst heat wave ever, bro. It was like horrible. I feel like most of the United States was kind of going through it, but especially California, it was like ungodly hot. So this past weekend, it was finally cool like it finally started to feel like an inkling of fall and i actually got a hot starbucks i got a i never tried this before i got a cafe mistro which is literally just like black coffee with steamed milk and i got steamed oat milk i got it unsweetened and i just felt so chic walking around with this coffee unsweetened coffee in the hot cup and it's like a little bit crispy outside like it was the best can't wait for it to hopefully get cooler and can't wait to go to new york and have that experience also forgot to mention this but if you enjoy the podcast don't forget to take an aesthetic pic or boomerang you on your hawk or walk listening you in the car i really love seeing who listens and i just really appreciate the support i feel like especially recently you guys have really been coming through so Thank you so much for that. It really means a lot to me. Yesterday, I was folding some laundry. I had a lot of laundry to fold and my bed to make, like with fresh sheets. So I was like, bro, let me listen. Well, I started with the first podcast me and Sonia ever did together. At least I think it was the first podcast. I have episodes all the way from 2015 on my SoundCloud, but you have to pay for like the unlimited SoundCloud account and i used to do that until i started using anchor and then it was distributing my podcast for me and i just wasn't really getting that many views on soundcloud so i was like i'm not gonna pay for that anymore so if i pay i can access those but on you know apple i don't even know if they're on youtube those old episodes i'd have to check that's actually smart that i thought of that i don't think so though i don't think i used to post on youtube back then but anyway on apple podcasts and spotify they go all the way back to 2017 and it's like around this time 2017 like maybe summer 2017 is when it starts but anyway there was an episode for me and sonia back then around this time of year which i thought was so crazy so i was like let me just listen to this just to see how far we've come i honestly expected to cringe a little more and when i say cringe i mean like cringe about everything i know my audio quality i at least i've had thought my audio quality used to be a lot worse i used to just put a lot less effort into these podcasts i feel like it's really only been the past year or so that i've been super consistent i mean i'd say longer than that i'd say longer than that i just used to be really inconsistent with it it just wasn't really like my main priority i don't think i even really used to edit my podcast so i was kind of expecting to cringe and just like oh my god it's gonna be so poorly like done and then i don't know how i'm gonna sound i don't know what we're gonna talk about but it actually ended up being pretty good i did cringe a little bit at my voice how much it's changed just in the style of how i talk almost it was more so it wasn't like oh my god turn this off like i was actually interested in what we were talking about so then after that i listened to one that i had just done by myself there was something about how to be confident or something and i was giving tips on like little things I do throughout the day to just be more confident. And it was actually pretty good. Like I was like, bro, like I'm good at this. <laughs> Something I did want to touch on though is in that podcast, I think it was like a Q&A type of podcast where I was giving advice. I wanted to just touch on something along the lines of how do I let go of anger towards somebody 
I think specifically my advice was something along the lines of like oh you need to practice forgiveness and I was talking about this book that I had read it was a Louise Hay book you can heal your life and I was like bro you just have to like imagine whoever you're angry at as a baby and like just tell them you forgive them and then imagine them as an adult and there was like a few other things it wasn't like everything I was saying I disagree with but like that specifically really stood out to me because I just feel like I do not agree with that now just in what I've learned about emotions and processing emotions you do not need to forgive someone to heal and move on definitely it still had that kind of toxic positivity sort of like spirituality in a bad way vibe that I feel like was I was kind of interested or like into then obviously not knowing that it was toxic so now I think my advice would be to learn how to process emotions and anger so when you have anger in your body it's like what does it feel like you know i know for myself i usually feel really like tight in my chest and just like hot and i'll just feel like especially in my arms and just all throughout my midsection but especially my chest will just feel tight and like hot and like almost in my temples like I feel it so it's like a physical experience you know so you need to do something physical to get rid of that so that could look like running that could look like punching a pillow that could look like you know literally beating on your chest where you feel that and that just helps get some of that energy out of you and then I think what really helps me try to ask myself what could I have done differently slash how did I get, how did I let myself get in that situation? I feel like a lot of us have probably had situations where we feel taken, taken advantage of, you know, it's not constructive to blame ourselves or shame ourselves further because we can already experience so much shame by feeling like a relationship didn't work out. But in order to not let something like that happen in the future, you do have to ask yourself, like, what decisions did I make to let it get to that point and i feel like a lot of the time it's like i was trying to people please i didn't stand up for myself i should have said no sooner on there were red flags i saw but it chose to ignore and then actively practicing that in my life that's like what i talk about all the time right the coffee example if they make your coffee wrong speak up and tell them the next time you start talking to someone new telling them no just about something random sooner on and just the practice of that builds a lot of trust and you start to grow as a person so then the more you move forward and further away from whatever happened in the past to make you angry you're like I can now see that as a separate experience. And it's like, okay, well, I didn't know then that I needed to do this, needed to do this differently, should have done this. But now I practice that. I'm aware of it and I practice it actively. So you start to build a trust in yourself and you're able to forgive yourself. And I guess almost like un not even forgive yourself, but understand yourself where you were at that point and be like okay well i know that wouldn't happen to me now so gonna move on i just feel like you you don't need to forgive the other person and it's not about like blaming yourself shaming yourself putting everything on yourself but as far as your own experience in your body with anger and just like frustration that that happened or you know whatever it is if someone fucked you over trying to be constructive about it like first processing the emotion in your body and then figuring out you know what steps led you there and then actively practicing that in your entire life not just in your next relationship but just everywhere in your life and building that trust so that would be like more so my advice now um obviously like i always say i'm not a professional and if something is just really bothering you if you just have so much like anger or i don't know whatever it is you may be dealing with like avi seek professional help also i think listening to your anger is really helpful i just really used to think of myself as so like chill and easygoing and like laid back and like oh i'm just you know positive vibes so something i've really learned is like listening to my anger in the moment and sometimes it's very especially if you are not used to expressing your anger sometimes it's very quiet and it's not 
you know, this overwhelming like rage or like overwhelming emotion. It's like very quiet and you might, bro, you know, the emotion wheel, how there's like the primary emotions and then they keep going out. So like being annoyed, actually the emotion is anger, though it may not be extreme as like rage. It's still a form of anger. So the next time maybe you're having a conversation with somebody and you start to kind of feel maybe annoyed or just a little bothered or a little on edge or, you know, angry, pause and ask yourself, is there a boundary that's being overstepped right now? Do I need to speak up for myself? What do I need to speak up for? And just really listening to yourself and especially those like small sensations in your body. And that's why it's so important and helpful to know what different emotions feel like in your body so that you can catch them in the moment as they're happening and act accordingly rather than waiting until later. Or, you know, maybe something's really bothering you in a friendship but you just you you never get to the point of rage. So you're like, well, it's probably fine. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. Whereas if you had caught it the first time when you're just maybe feeling like a little bit annoyed, it's like you could have just set the boundary, the anger or the annoyance, you know, goes away and you can just continue on. But it's hard to catch unless you know. So spending time really just thinking about how your body feels when you experience different emotions can be so helpful. And again, that just builds so much self-trust. And therefore, I feel like you have less long-lasting anger or frustration about certain things because you're speaking up in the moment and you're dealing with it in the moment as it comes up. That's what's helped me and that's how my advice on that would change. So I've read further into Communion by Bell Hooks, book of the month, I guess. I have like a third left to read and y'all, if I could like post every single page of this on my IG story highlighted, I would. There is something on every page. Like there is a golden nugget. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> on literally every page. So I would 100% recommend this to all of you. So something that really stood out to me in this chapter, choosing and learning to love, was she talks about how women are often seen or portrayed as natural caregivers and more nurturing just bio biologically than men. But actually, a lot of that is just through socialization. So I just wanted to read this. After several years of living alone, I began to think seriously about my relationship to intimacy. Until then, I, like many women in similar circumstances, felt that the problems in my relationships were caused by my male partner's fear of intimacy. I chose men who were quiet, reserved, private, who were loners, often withholding, and being alone and celibate gave me the psychic space to confront myself and examine my relationship to intimacy. Soon it was obvious that I had chosen partners who were not particularly into intimacy because then I never had to make a leap of faith to trust or to risk. Being with men who were not interested in offering abiding closeness meant that I never really had to be that close. Yet I could have an image of myself as this open, giving woman who really desired closeness, at times feeling smug because I worked so hard on the relationship. Working to be close with someone who is not interested in sustained closeness not only depresses the spirit, it makes you a perfect target for aggression. Many women who are warm and open-hearted choose men who are closed and shut down because we hope we can provide a catalyst for them to open up. Our efforts usually fail because these men have not made their own commitment to being open. Trained to be nurturers and caregivers, women often think we are behaving as we should, doing what we have been socialized to believe is a woman's job. This unfulfilling work keeps us from the real work of intimacy. I had grown up in a patriarchal household where my mother had waited on my father hand and foot. When she was not meeting his needs, she was meeting the needs of her children. Her needs were rarely, if ever, met. I'm not even sure she could have articulated her needs and desires because she had been so well trained to believe that a good wife and mother has no desires beyond the welfare of her family. Most of the marriages and relationships I saw were ones in which women were always the primary caregivers and had little time for self-development. Women are often arrogant when it comes to matters of the heart. Believing the mystification of our sexist social conditioning, which encourages us to assume we know how to love, 
as though desire and action were one and the same. We may suffer countless relational failures before we begin to think critically about the nature of love. Women involved with men who believe that they are more able to love are predisposed to accept male emotional withholding. They already expect men to be deficient. This does not mean they do not hope that the male they are relating to will learn how to be more emotionally giving. They do. The tragic irony here is that patriarchal thinking has socialized males to believe that their manhood is affirmed when they are emotionally withholding. Social conditioning creates the differences in the sexes we are encouraged to think are natural and simultaneously lays the groundwork for conflict. Nothing proves female allegiance to patriarchy more than the willingness to behave as though the problems created by cultural investment in sexist thinking about the nature of male and female roles can be solved by women working harder. Women who cling to the notion that if they just simply change their behavior, that men will happily learn how to be more caring are in denial. Their denial strengthens patriarchy, but does not create a universe where women and men can love one another. Anti-patriarchal thinking, which assumes that both women and men are equally capable of learning how to love, of giving and receiving love, is the only foundation on which to construct sustained, meaningful, mutual love. There was a time where I arrogantly and naively thought that women were more loving than men. I thought this because we were the group I heard talking the most about love, seeking it and celebrating it when we found it. We were also the group that talked the most about our disappointments in love. When it came to heterosexual love and romance, we were convinced men were the problem. And heady, fun years of contemporary feminism simply reinforced the idea that we women were superior to men when it came to our emotional universe. Then most women believed that we were better lovers because we had been trained to be caregivers, to nurture. Our cultural idealization of women as caregivers is so powerful. It's really one of the few positive traits assigned women by patriarchy. Therefore, it's not surprising that women are reluctant and at times downright unwilling to interrogate notions that we are inherently more loving. If this is the only positive characteristic females are allowed to claim, the one trait that lets us be seen as morally superior to men, most women will continue to be deeply invested in clinging to the perception that we are loving, even when we know we are not. There is no doubt in my mind that it is easier for females of any age to learn the art of loving than it is for their male counterparts. It is easier because our interest in love is not questioned. To the extent that any woman takes the time and makes the choice to learn what love is, we are more supported in this endeavor than men are. More often than not, the assumption that women naturally love more and better than men actually keeps us from facing our problems with love and intimacy. That's why so many of us only begin to learn what love really is in midlife. Let's not kid ourselves. We find mutual love only when we know how to love. And the best place to start practicing the art of loving is with the self. The one person who will never leave us whom we will never lose is ourself. Learning to love our female selves is where our search for love must begin. We begin this journey to love by examining the ideas and beliefs we have held about the nature of intimacy and true love. Rather than embracing a faulty thinking that encourages us to believe that females are inherently loving, we make the choice to become loving. Choosing love, we affirm our agency, our commitment to personal growth, and our emotional openness. Bet y'all didn't expect that. Do y'all remember that Shan Booty interview? I never saw the whole podcast, but I saw the clip on IG and then it was kind of popping off on Twitter. I forget who this girl was, but she was basically talking about how she does everything for her man, like emotionally, and just puts everything, like sacrifices so much of herself into the relationship one of the examples i really remember is like she was like i know him so well i know him better than he knows himself i know when he falls to sleep because his breathing changes and i'm the one rubbing his back to sleep shannon was like well what do you gain from this relationship and she like didn't really know what to say when you read about this like this is the one thing that we kind of that women kind of gain out of patriarchy is oh we are inherently better at loving and caregiving finally we have something over men it's like no wonder this woman and so many women are okay with that self-sacrifice to their male partners because it's like oh i'm doing something right we almost see that as a reward like wow like i'm so exhausted from caretaking my man like i'm such a good wife even though it's like at the end of the day what do you gain? So she ends the chapter talking about love and then the next chapter is titled Grow Into a Woman's Body and Love It where she talks about how much our society 
<laughs> hates women. Our culture lets us get away with thinking that we can hate our bodies and still be seen as the group most capable of teaching others about love. From time to time, a mother will approach me about her young daughter's self-hatred. I sense agitation and the desire to flee when I begin to ask the mother questions about how she feels about herself, her body, and her being. Many mothers want to believe that if they just put the right things on the wall, buy the right books and wardrobe and say affirming things that their girl children will feel good about themselves. A parent who reassures a girl child that she is fine just as she is and who then repeatedly downgrades herself and other female peers is not laying the groundwork for healthy body self-esteem. Also, overall cultural devaluation of the female body affects the self-esteem of all girls even those who are raised in loving homes. Constant vigilance is required to protect female body self-esteem. Women can begin to do the work of becoming self-loving by first reclaiming the right to inhabit a healthy body and to identify that as the foundation of beauty and attractiveness. This is one of the cultural revolutions that can take place just by our saying no. What we must say no to is a world that tells us we are solely defined by our, by our physical bodies, that these female bodies are inadequate, lacking, and not good enough. Saying no to any devaluation and debasement of the female body is a loving practice. And then in the next chapter, and this is the last part I will read, Sisterhood, Love, and Solidarity, where she talks, so she goes from loving the self to like loving others, other women. Self-love is, and I took pictures of this, which is why I'm reading it off my phone. Self-love is always risky for women within patriarchy. Females are, re re females, <laughs> are rewarded more when we experience ourselves and act as though we are flawed, insecure, or especially dependent and needy. A woman who does not learn how first to fulfill her psychological needs for acceptance will always operate from a space of lack. This psychic state will make her vulnerable and often lead her into unhealthy relationships. Although it is risky, when we are self-loving, our growing contentment and personal power sustains us when we are rejected or punished for refusing to follow conventional sexist rules. Self-help books and therapies encourage us to believe that acts of self-love will make life better, happier, so it is especially confusing to women when we choose to be self-loving only to find ourselves resented. In my sweetest period of self-recovery, when I felt I was finally embracing myself wholeheartedly, I was initially thrown off balance by the lack of positive response to these changes. It was as though people in my life liked me better when I was in crisis, not eating properly, or depressed. In graduate school, I was always awed of, in the presence of successful, beautiful older women who seemed to have everything. Then I would later hear about their alcoholism or other self-destructive habits. Knowing that these women had serious problems mediated their power in the eyes of many of their peers. It made the hatred of their power less intense. Often they were the objects of pity. Had they been healthy, had they been perceived as really having it all, they would assuredly have been the objects of vicious envy and cruel attacks. More men were attracted to me and to other women I knew when we were untogether. This is because it's easier to subordinate someone who does not feel good about herself or her life, or someone who may feel constantly insecure and afraid. While fewer men may want women who are healthy and self-loving, bonds with these men who do are more affirming, constant, and fulfilling. No woman who chooses to be self-loving ever regrets her choice. Self-love brings her greater power and freedom. It improves her relationships with everyone, but most especially, it allows her to live in community with other women, to stand in solidarity and sisterhood. When we are self-loving, we attend to the deeper needs of our soul. We no longer fear abandonment or loss of recognition. We see ourselves clearly as we really are. And that clarity is the source of our strength and peace of mind. It is the space of mindful awareness where we can search for love together, cherishing the sweetness of sustained female solidarity, period. I have probably talked before about how you know, when you maybe start setting boundaries, when you embark on your self-love journey, your healing journey, some relationships are going to fall away. Or like if you tell someone no, if you set a boundary, it's like there is always that risk that they're not going to like it. And worst case scenario, choose not to fuck with you anymore. But then was that even a relationship worth keeping, right? And I love that part of what she said about, you know, society almost likes us better society does like us better when we're insecure when we lack self-love because think about it men can more easily manipulate us we're more likely able to be sold products think of how many products are marketed towards women basically telling us we're not enough 
oh, well, you don't want to be like this, this, and this, but we can, (laughs) for a small fee, we can sell you something that can make you worth it, make you lovable, make you worthy. And I also love that part. She says, you know, fewer men may want women who are healthy and self-loving, but the bonds with the men who do are more affirming, constant, and fulfilling. And same goes for friendships, for really any kind of relationship, you know, because that relationship will be built on a solid foundation. It's not built upon insecurity. And I love what she says about no woman who chooses to be self-loving ever regrets that choice. So even though it can feel really scary or like, oh, I'm going to lose, you know, my relationship or things are going to change, it's like for the best. So this book just really covers everything and... I wish every woman would read this book because I, I feel like it just explains so much, you know, and there's so much in this book that, you know, I haven't read to you guys, so you should definitely read it. I feel like I'm gaining so much from this book and it's just so affirming because so many things we go through and, you know, I feel like my podcast is a place where I talk about things and we can discuss them, but I feel like just a lot, just in general... And historically speaking, women go through so much that we just don't talk about because so many things that we experience do bring up a lot of shame. And because they're not talked about, we feel really alone, like we're the only ones going through that. And, you know, reading a book like this just makes you, and especially being able to talk about it, but even just reading it just makes you feel so much more like normal or like oh there's like an explanation for this you know it's not just like a me problem it's not just like oh that's how it has to be like there's something to be done about it you know knowledge really is power and the more we can learn and educate ourselves become self-loving ourselves the less bullshit we're gonna put up with and i'm sure y'all have seen like the posts about well i'm sure you've seen post period about like women talking about their date experiences or this or that and therefore the post that come as a result of that like oh i'm so glad you know with social media especially it just makes it so much easier for women to discuss relationships and i do feel like the bar for heterosexual relationships is getting higher y'all remember that one study or news article that was like men what did they say it was basically like because the bar for relationships especially for men, is higher. Men either need to step it up or they're going to be alone. (laughs) So there's like always this image of like, oh, the poor like old maid women who never got married. But now it's like men. And I feel like that was a lie to begin with because men benefit way more from marriage than women. Women's life expectancy goes down in marriage. So just like keep that in mind. So let me know if you've read this. I will link it down below on Amazon if you want to get it, but look at your local library to see if they have it as well. I think I am going to buy this book because I just feel like it hits every point and it's just so easy to read, you know? Love it. Love to see it. Y'all got to read this. Y'all, I almost got a venti coffee and I was like, "Mm, it's just going to be too much. Maybe it would have been, but the thing is like, Ugh. I now I have none and it's like I want to keep drinking it's not like I feel like I need to be more caffeinated so maybe it's a good thing I didn't get a venti because I haven't even really been finishing my ventis these days but I just like having something to sip on have you guys seen the girl on tiktok with like the eight different types of ice cubes that's like my fantasy if I like I can't wait to have a house and to just be able to fully like invest in that house you know like in a sense of like If I want a really fancy ice maker or like a fridge with a really fancy ice maker, I am going to get that. Do you guys remember that sound on TikTok that was like, what's the one thing in your house that everyone thinks is so cool? And it was like, they basically had a coffee bar on their kitchen countertop. Like there was a touch screen and you could like built in and it just would come out of this little spout. And it was so, I was like, I wonder what the logistics of owning that are though. Like how often do you have to clean it? How do you clean it? Is it like annoying? Does it ever malfunction? You know, there was this other tweet I saw too that was like, I can't believe you actually have to clean your house every day. I thought my mom was just neurotic. When I feel like I'm not home a lot, which is not often, honestly, (laughs) let's be real. But I feel like my house gets messy. Even if it's just like I'm leaving for the day, my house will like feel messy because it's like, oh, I had to rush to leave. Maybe I didn't do all the dishes before I left. So I come home and it's like messy. But then it's like when I'm living in my house and I'm at home more, it gets dirty because there's like more crumbs. There's like more hair. It's just like 
you really and it's like i don't even it's just me here bro i have no one to blame but myself but yeah honestly i had the best deep clean this past weekend i love a deep clean when i'm like in the mood to do it and i do like everything i mopped for the first time in like a couple weeks that was like amazing i just love the feeling of the floors after i mop it's so nice so last thing i wanted to talk about i saw two tiktoks and they i realized they were kind of like related so the first one was this girl talking about this date she went on and it was just like a date story time whatever but something that really stood out to me was she said something along the lines of i don't i don't know if i actually like going on dates or if i just really like acting and then i saw this tiktok of this older woman and i'm just gonna play that one the fact that times people ask me did you ever really love any man i did but they were never men with whom i was sexually involved yes soon as sex came into the picture somehow for me there was a lack of respect i knew i couldn't keep them without practicing what are called feminine wiles you know, the flirtiness, the cuteness, and the opposite of who And I hated myself doing it, yes. and I hated them buying into that part of me. Yes. I hated them and didn't respect them for that at all. Yes, it was an and act. Somehow, they just went from the foreground to the background. That also just stood out to me so much, because I feel like that's so true. And also, it goes into, act, like, not even just relationships, but actual sex, you know, and how much of it, you know is a performance in heterosexual relationships we're taught so much that our worth is in how we look we're so focused on performing and making sure that we're doing a good job and we're doing it right and we're like pleasing him that we're not in our own bodies we're not focusing on our own pleasure which not it's not to say be selfish but it's like it shouldn't only be about the man bitch so moving from performance to pleasure but yeah it also goes in to other aspects of relationships too, you know? And I think I've talked about that before. I've definitely experienced it where you kind of, just like the realization that you're seen as like a woman or like if you're going on a date with a guy or spending time with a guy, just realizing that you're kind of like in this role of being like the girl and not just like being yourself, your full self. And so much of it is so just automatic. We don't even think about it. It's just like what we think we're naturally doing almost or like maybe we're not even thinking about it but then it's like bro like we're doing this because we're like socialized to do it and it's like kind of what the man expects so that's like another aspect of healing and i think self-love like i want to be seen slash i want to invest my time with someone who sees me as a full person and who loves me for my entire self not just as you know a woman fulfilling the role of the woman so and bro it's like tough like it really limits your options i feel because a lot of guys just want to see you as that bro it's like i literally would rather be alone than ever do that shit again <laughs> i am over and i am in too deep now i know too much bro I know too much. <laughs> if you're just listening to this, not watching, I held up the bell hooks, but it's like, I can't like, bro. Cause now it's like, especially when you're aware of it, it's like, yes, it's good you're aware, but then it's like, you just, you can't participate in it because you're just gonna cringe at yourself every five seconds. So yeah, and I'm not saying like, oh my God, it's like impossible. But I, I feel like it just, especially in dating, casual dating, like seeing your options, it can definitely be hard. But with that, and then it also just makes you think like how much of femininity is natural. And that's a whole another conversation. I'm not even going to get into that right now because I haven't like fully thought about it. But you know, it's like, oh, like she's just such a girly girl. It's like, it's like, is she naturally? I mean, I guess, but like, it's like how much of it is socialized and not natural actually. Dudes may not want you, but at least the ones who do will want you and love you for your entire complete self which at the end at the end of the day is going to be a lot more rewarding and fulfilling i guess i should have talked about libra season um because i didn't last week but yeah it's libra season now fun and fresh and flirty all of virgo season bitch i did not drink i did not go out i was very much in the house and i low-key expect that vibe to continue on until i go to new york but 
um yeah that's just kind of my mood i'm trying to wrap things up go through stuff still mercury retrograde though it does end on the first slash second it ends this weekend so let me know down below did you have any realizations this mercury retrograde did any tbts come back did you reach out to anybody from the past <laughs> let us know join the discord if you want to chat with like-minded girlies and build that community have that sense of community and let me know if you read the book and yeah i can't wait to see all of your comments and again post this on your story tag me so i can repost love you guys so much and i will talk to you next week